Good evening, everyone. My name is John Hughes. I'm the music director of Chicago Master Singers. Welcome to another session of CMS University. I'm glad you're here and part of this online community. And one of the ways that we are fostering these relationships during this time of being separate uh, is hosting these live streams where we can at least be together virtually. And I invite you to participate in the chat window on the right hand side of your screen. It's been really fun to watch um, friendships really be made and reinforced um, through the chat window. And no need to um, be a frequent contributor. Everyone's welcome to participate. The only trick about it is to first make sure you're logged into YouTube and then you can uh, join in. If you're watching this live on Monday evening, you can um, even ask me a question. Uh, just start it with three or four question marks in a row. That way I can quickly identify what's intended for me. And then uh, I'll put it up on the screen as time allows and I'll try my best to answer. Now our topic for tonight is actually the first in a two-part series on Lutheran music. So tonight we're talking about Martin Luther, the man, and uh, his reformation and how it influenced music uh, for centuries to come. Next week then we'll be talking about J.S. Bach and really his lineage of the Bach family. He came from a long line of, of uh, musicians, both before him and after him, and really kind of encapsulated a lot of the reforms that um, Luther started, Bach would then um, kind of perfect. So let's get into uh, this topic for tonight, which is the man on our left here, Martin Luther. Now, I know uh, when I think of Martin Luther in terms of music, my mind pretty quickly gets to the other man here on our right, J.S. Bach. Uh, I think it's pretty common that a lot of us kind of associate these two um, as being closely related. But a simple math problem actually shows us that that might not be the best way to understand them. So let's just look first at Luther. Luther. Reformation kind of formally began in 1517 when he nailed his 95 theses to the castle door. Now, it's really clear to remember that, uh, first of all, Luther sought out to reform the Catholic Church, not break away from it, um, but that he was not the first reformer, right? There's an old joke that he was just the first reformer to live, right? So a lot of people had, had uh, revolutionary or reformative ideas that was kind of in the air. Um, and Luther was kind of the first one to really make it public uh, successfully. Um, now, again, we cite 1517 as a start of this because that's when he uh, did that drastic action of nailing his ideas to the castle door. So 1517 is when we say it really formally began. Bach, however, J.S. Bach, was born in 1685, he died in 1750. So again, that simple math problem shows us that actually a century and a half separate Luther and Bach. And that's a huge amount of time. And I think that really challenges, at least for me, uh, a notion of how connected these two people actually were. Um, I believe a better, more kind of nuanced understanding is that um, Luther was really the cornerstone of this Protestant musical tradition and that Bach, in a way, is a capstone. He's the summation of all these Reformation efforts. Um, and frankly, he kind of perfected it so well that music had to change after Bach because there was just, he had, it, it was, the, the rag was kind of wrung out. Now, um, so we're going to be talking tonight a little bit about um, what Luther did to create the special world that Bach would eventually come to perfect. Um, and all of those roots are, are, go back to Luther himself. Um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about some composers whose shoulders Bach is standing on. Because again, 150 years separating um, Luther and Bach that's generations of composers, right, who really contributed to building up this musical culture. And so I'm going to share some names with you and some music with you that um, 
you can kind of get glimmers of, of Bach uh, from. So that's the plan for tonight. We're going to do this by kind of looking at Luther in kind of different atmospheres or different spheres of influence. So first, we'll talk about him as a hymn writer and, and liturgist. Then we'll talk about him and his use of publicity, his effects and influences on musical culture, and then finally his effects on uh, life and education. Now, before we get too much farther, I just want to say this is not intended as a hero worship of uh, Martin Luther. Martin Luther certainly had really profound ideas uh, theologically and culturally um, that um, we're grateful for, right? Without humanism, there wouldn't be the Reformation. Without the Reformation, there might not be humanism in the way that we enjoy it today. Um, but we should also remember that Luther was a man of his time. He said some pretty um, abhorrent comments about different groups. Uh, so I do want to just kind of disclaimer right away, this is not a um, hero worship, but it, more an examination of how one person who was flawed um, did influence uh, music and, and a lot of the music we love today. Okay, so with that said, let's go into his hymns and liturgies. So, um, one big thing to remember about Luther is what he was trying to accomplish in his reforms, right? And for our purposes tonight, his goal is to make the common person in the pew at a church service more of an active participant than a passive observer of the clergy at the altar. One way that he did that was through hymns, because that was a way that people, the common person, could participate, right, instead of just watch what was happening. Now, the issue is that there weren't a lot of hymns at the time, right? This was a new idea. And so what Luther did was kind of beg, borrow, and steal to find hymns. Um, so he would take um, kind of popular songs. You know, there's old, uh, you know, folklore about, um, you know, Luther taking drinking songs and, and songs out of bars and repurposing them. I think some of that is true. Some of it is kind of uh, uh, urban legend, if you will. Um, but he, he did write hymns in a popular style um, with, that were very catchy and memorable. He also put things in the vernacular language, so in German instead of in Latin. And these then um, really, he set these um, tunes with texts that were simple, easy to understand, but that captured his theological differences um, very concisely. And so it's kind of like these, these chorales or these hymns that Luther wrote were almost like commercial jingles, where they give you the most important thing with a mnemonic device to help you remember it, right? And this was part of the education of the parishioner. And it not only enabled them to uh, more fully participate in the worship service, it allowed them to take some ownership over the theology that they believed, rather than just accepting what they've been taught. And it also um, removed the importance of the clergy and allowed the parishioner to have kind of direct access to God without that intermediary of the clergy. So these were really um, almost subcultural or countercultural um, efforts musically. Now we're going to look at his probably most famous chorale, or, uh, the Ein Feste Burg, A Mighty Fortress. This is kind of sometimes known as the battle hymn of the Reformation. This was used kind of as a, as a fight song, um, and it really does capture a lot of what Luther was doing. Now you'll notice in this image here that this is actually in Luther's hand, uh, and you'll notice he used the alto clef there, which is good for him. Uh, and you can see he signed it at the bottom with kind of a Latinized version of his name. This chorale, of course, um, spawned a lot of other composers to use this tune. 
Um, they're all listed there, but um, a very, very important hymn, and it came directly from Luther himself. Now, I found a recording of about a 30-second uh, recording of someone singing, a group singing, how this would have sounded in Luther's day. So we're going to listen just briefly to how uh, this would have been sung back in the early 16th century. Some of you might recognize that version of the hymn as isorhythmic, right? So sometimes um, hymnals today will have it two ways, right? They'll have that isorhythmic version, which sounds syncopated. Of course, that's not how Luther would have thought of it, but it has kind of this, this offbeat dance feel to it. Ba, 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 ba. This very, these lilting three groupings in the middle of it. And then the hymnals today, because that might be a little tricky to read, um, might put it in 4-4 four, four. that's more metrical. But apparently this is the version that Luther himself wrote. There's great debate about this, so I'll just leave it there. But that is just one example of a very famous hymn and how it would have been sung and so why it's important. Now, Luther also wrote liturgies, which is kind of like the order of worship. And um, he did two. The first one in 1523 called the Formula Mass um, was very similar to um, the Catholic worship services before it. So in Latin, it very much followed all the tradition of what had existed before it. The real departure, though, is in 1526 when he writes the Deutsche Messe. In this one, he really um, retained a lot of the Catholic pattern of worship. So what's happening at the altar, what's happening in the pews is very much the same. But he makes some real key differences, uh, changes. And again, these are all geared at making it more participatory for the average person. So how does he do that? First of all, he uses that vernacular language the German language, right? That's what Deutsche, right? A German mass. So he puts it in the people's language. The congregation in his liturgy sings four times. So that's significant, right? They're not just watching a show up front. They're engaged. And he also really um, emphasizes the importance of the choir and the organ, which are still hallmarks of Lutheran worship today. Now, it's important to think about um, two things. One, even after the Deutsche Messe, Latin was still used in Lutheran churches. So it's not like in 1526 they decided to throw away everything in Latin. A lot of composers, like Heinrich Schutz even, writes in both German and Latin. That was still common. So there is a movement toward the vernacular, but not at the cost of eliminating Latin. The other point about the Deutsche Messe is that it really did have long-lasting effects. So if we think about Brahms, right, in the late 19th century writing his Requiem, what does he title it? Ein Deutsches Requiem. This is a direct nod to Luther's liturgy. Brahms was a scholar of early Lutheran music. We know his library contained lots and lots of scores of early Lutheran People like Schutz and Scheidt and Schein and even Leonard Lech Lechner, who I wrote my dissertation on. So he was really an expert on early Lutheran music, certainly was aware of Luther's Deutsche Messe. And in his Requiem, he did very similar things to what Luther did in this German Mass. What did Brahms do? 
he puts the text in German, right? It's not the Latin um, order of, of uh, the Requiem service like what Mozart followed, right? Brahms does something completely different. He puts it in German. All the texts come from the Bible, right? Which is the importance of kind of the Bible as a sole authority that goes directly to Luther, right? So, and he, the other similarity is that he's really trying to make this kind of a German um, feeling, right? That this is a people's mass, right? So um, this, it's just one of my point here is that Luther's uh, Deutsche Mass has profound in inspiration for this piece, Ein Deutsches Requiem, that we all know and love, but that, apparent, that connection might not always be apparent. All right, let's uh, talk about Luther as a publicist, because he was a real genius in this way. So part of it was just the confluence of when he was alive, right? So the Gutenberg Press at the end of the 15th century um, really takes off, right? And um, this, without the press and this invention of mass publication, uh, Luther's Reformation would not have had the legs that it did. In particular, what Luther did was partner with this man here, Georg Rau, and they worked closely together to produce um, pamphlets that were mostly hymns, mo many of which Luther composed himself, with a theological introduction, a short one to two pages explaining what Luther was teaching. And this was really significant because it not only spread his ideas, right, but it also provided a way for people at home to worship, right? This was a devotional book that families could use at home in the evenings to as a devotional practice and luther with his innovations musically of easy memorable melodies in german with kind of a succinct encapsulation of his theological ideas what luther does is then gives that to the people and again now they're not just inactive uh, viewers on Sunday morning, now they're able to participate as part of their daily lives. And this is really significant and helps them then become, helps his ideas and his movement really um, take off and, and, and form some deep connections. So kind of in conclusion for both Luther as a musician and as a publicist, it, it's this mass publication of hymns that were not complicated, that were memorable, that were in German. Luther really kind of can, creates a uh, unstoppable vehicle for spreading his message. And uh, this is going to have profound influence on musical life and, and, and tradition in Germany for centuries to come. Now, before we get to that, let me stop here and briefly look at the chat. I think I noticed a few questions here. Um, okay, Dan Creed. Yeah, doesn't sound, uh, doesn't Luther's hymn sound like uh, our God is a mighty fortress? Yes, it's the same, same one, uh, just a little different setting, right? So sometimes you might hear it in 4-4, that kind of metered version. What they were singing was um, the isorhythmic. And a lot of modern hymnals, print both versions um, and kind of depends on the congregation how, how adventurous they are. Um, yes, Luther's uh, original liturgy is still present in some uh, of today's uh, Lutheran hymnals. Um, there's, you know, a million uh, Lutheran hymnals these days and um, a lot of now, you know, there's not just one Lutheran church anymore, right? There's many, many synods, um, that, and it seems like there's even more every year popping up, um, and they all use different hymns, but this liturgy is available, and I'm sure that there are some churches that definitely use it. Um, okay, John Lee, did Luther include four-part uh, settings for his hymns, or were they just the melody? 
Uh, I believe they were just the melody, what he wrote, but of course, then organists or whoever harmonized them. Um, but we do know that Luther was an ardent lover of music. In particular, I know I read once that he um, particularly favored the music of Josquin, who uh, the great Franco-Flemish uh, Renaissance composer. So we do know that about him. Um, did did Herr Katy have anything to do with his music? I'm not exactly sure who you're referring to. Maybe Katie Luther, his wife. I'm not sure if she um, was musical or not. Um, so, good one. You stumped me there. Um, how many were musically literate enough to read his music? That's a good question. Probably not uh, an incredible amount of people could read music, but if you think about a modern worship setting today, there are hymnals, people are re reading along. Um, and reading to different extents, right? You know, some people are reading uh, the hymnal and, you know, jumping. If they're like me, I'll sing the soprano, and then the alto, and then the tenor, and the bass, if there are four verses, or jump around. Um, and some people are reading mostly the words and maybe kind of looking at the notes for the contour. So um, I'm not exactly sure, you know, what percentage of the population did, but I'm sure it's about what it is today. Um, Okay, let's go on, uh, and I'll look at the chat in a minute. Okay, uh, where are we? Here we are. Luther's musical influence. So, Luther does all this great stuff, right? He, he writes these hymns, he writes this liturgy, he um, figures out how to get it out, right? And so now let's look at what happened. What was the effect of that? So, basically, the importance that Luther placed on music in worship created this musical culture in Germany that is really unlike anything ever before seen in that part of the world. And one of the reasons for this is that he really gave musicians freedom. They were able to compose what they wanted, right? And this is where we see this, this connection between um, the Reformation and humanism, right? So musicians were now able to pick different texts, right? They didn't have to just pick um, the, the same text out of the Lieber to uh, set. They could pick, you know, a, a verse from the Bible. They could write, uh, set a devotional poem, right? Like we see in uh, the cantatas of J.S. Bach, right? So they were able to write in a, artistically um, for, for the first time within the context of the worship service. So this is a huge development. The other big thing here, and here's a little bit of Luther himself kind of singing uh, and playing. Uh, we know he loved to do this in the evenings. Um, one of the big things about this culture that he created is that music was valued educationally. So a lot of young German Lutheran musicians traveled to Italy to study. We see this time and again throughout the 1600s and 1700s. And it's this combination of German piety, German hymnody, and Italian dramatic music, particularly opera. This combination is what really creates this special world. And, um, you know, even someone like J.S. Bach, who never did travel to Italy, um, he reaped those benefits too, because the people he was, his peers and, and colleagues did, and he heard their music, right? So this is a huge, huge um, development in music is this kind of um, multinational influence that eventually happened. So some Lutheran composers before 1700, right? So remember, J.S. Bach wasn't born until 1685. So I think, you know, 1700 is a good dividing line between kind of earlier Lutheran composers and later ones. So these are in chronological order. I'm guessing a lot of you have heard, I mean, you've heard me tonight talk about the three S's of early Lutheran music. So we have Heinrich Schutz, Johann Hermann Schein, and Samuel Scheidt, the three S's, those are important. I'm sure you've all heard of Pachelbel, 
Maybe you've heard of Hassler and Pretorius Buxtehuda. Those are kind of the, the later half, the latter half of this early group. Um, but there were all these other ones that were really important too. I would point you to, uh, in particular, Zenful is important, Gallus, Leonard Lechner, who, again, I wrote my dissertation on. I'll be talking a lot about Lechner in um, an upcoming session all about making a modern edition of Renaissance music. So you'll hear that name again. Um, Johannes Eckhart, and then finally, uh, Philip Nikolai, who wrote many, many chorales that we still sing today. So these are some just names to explore um, if you're interested in this. Now, you're probably going to be more familiar with the names on the next slide, Lutheran composers after 1700. So here we have Telemann, right? And of course, J.S. Bach, Handel, um, many of Bach's children's, like C.P.E. Bach or John Bach, the London Bach. Um, we, of course, Johannes Brahms, we've talked about already tonight. The Mendelssohns, so we have Fanny Hensel and uh, her brother, Felix Mendelssohn, um, converted to Lutheranism, and Hugo Disser. And then, of course, you know, there are many, many uh, composers uh, after this, and, and also traditions, right? One of the last sessions of CMSU uh, this spring will focus on um, four kind of legacy institutions in choral music in the United States. So we'll look at the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, we'll look at the Handel Haydn uh, Society in Boston, and we're going to look at the St. Olaf Choir, which, you know, St. Olaf and many other uh, small liberal arts colleges of the Lutheran tradition um, have um, an Americanized version of Lutheranism that is hugely important, right? And obviously traces uh, those schools, trace their roots back to Luther as well. So his reforms really did um, have, they have lasting influence even to today. Okay, so let's um, listen to an example of an earlier Lutheran uh, piece. This is about a minute long, and it's called Lop Gott mit Schall. It's a very lilting piece. It's in German. It feels very Renaissance-like, very kind of dancing. Um, and the Alleluia at the end, you can see how it might have influenced Bach. You know, I don't know if he's, he was familiar with this particular piece, but the way that Schutz constructs the Alleluia is very similar to what Bach would eventually do too. So, short little piece by Schutz. Nice to hear such a live uh, acoustic, but that's what they had back then. That's how all the churches were, right? So a very light, lively piece that I think really kind of captures that early Lutheran spirit. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, how Bach and, or I'm sorry, how Bach, how Luther and his reforms um, had effects not just in music, but in education and life in general. Uh, so, one of the big things that we see is the establishment of schools throughout Germany. And, in fact, we see that throughout the United States, right? There are a lot of Lutheran parochial schools 
um, that are kind of emulating Luther's ideas uh, from the 1500s. So Luther established schools throughout Germany and insisted, because he was such a lover of music, that they prioritize music within the education of every student, right? So um, this is huge for two reasons. First of all, just providing access to students is, um, to education was revolutionary. And then to insist that music was part of being a well-rounded, educated adult um, was also significant. This wasn't reserved um, for the elite, right? So this was uh, really important stuff. He also expanded this education to include young girls. Now, it was not equitable. Um, I read that in his curriculum that he wrote, um, the boys would stay all day and the girls would be dismissed at lunchtime to go home and do uh, the chores. But still, you know, it was uh, it was an improvement, right? So this was um, really significant, and this is kind of in partnership with his idea of uh, sending people or encouraging people to go to Italy to study, right? That this was creating a culture where education, and in particular, musical education, was really valued. This is a very famous quote here that Luther wrote maybe toward the end of his life in 1538. Um, and in particular, the last line is important. Next to the word of God, the noble art of music is the greatest treasure in this world. It controls our thoughts, minds, hearts, and spirits. Now, whether you uh, follow Luther's teachings or not, I think um, what I want you to take away from this is, um, first of all, just a reassurance that someone you know, 500 years ago thought that music was as important as we do and that it really does nourish the soul and uh, involve the brain and that it, it is as meaningful uh, today, then as it is today. So I hope you can uh, take that away from this and I hope this was of interest to you. Um, let me uh, just share a few uh, things if you want to read a little bit more about this. I think if you were like me, you know, there's a lot of this um, period between Luther and Bach that I just had no idea about really until I went into graduate school. But a couple sources here that I'd really point out to you. Um, the first one is that Johannes Riedel, uh, Cantors at the Crossroads, Essays on Church Music in Honor of Walter E. Budson. This is a great book. It's, you know, fairly uh, older in terms of scholarship, 1967. But it is a really um, readable source, and it really uh, does kind of lay things out nicely. The other one that I really recommend is by Carl Schock, Rest His Soul. He recently passed away. Um, he was a longtime professor at um, Concordia University over in River Forest and involved at Grace Lutheran River Forest in their cantata series. And um, so really kind of a pillar of early Lutheran music and scholarship, and he wrote a book in 2001 called Music and Early Lutheranism. So this is a very, it's a very easy, accessible read, um, but you know, if you're interested in learning more about someone like Johannes Eckhart or Leonard Lechner, someone that you might not um, be familiar with, but really did, you know, lay some pretty significant stepping stones for Bach, I'd point you to that. All right, before we get through our housekeeping and, of course, our moment of Zen tonight, I'll take a second here and look at the chat if there are any questions here. Um, what part did Luther sing? You know, that's a good question, Eileen. I, I believe, I don't want you to quote me on this, but I believe he sang tenor. I believe, but I'm not exactly sure. I do know that he was a choir boy, as a, as a child. So he, he was trained. It wasn't just a um, kind of a hobby singer. He w really knew what he was doing. Um, let's see. If there are any other ones. I think that's it. Oh, here. Was there a relationship between Luther and, and Renaissance artists? I'm not sure about that. I, I have not, you know, my, obviously my field of study has been music. 
So I'm not incredibly versed with art um, and uh, if Luther had that same relationship, but I, I don't think so. I think his main focus was theology and using music to elevate his, his teachings. Okay, well, let's do just a few uh, brief housekeeping announcements. Uh, just first of all, thanks for being here. I hope this has been interesting to you. And I hope you'll come back next week when I'm talking all about the many, many Bachs, all of whom seem to be named Johann or some variant of it. So you can watch and see if I uh, trip up at all next week. You can register for that by um, using the Eventbrite link in our video description below. Give the video a like, subscribe to our channel, share it with a friend or family member, invite someone else to join in. And remember too that if you haven't, um, if you've missed any uh, previous sessions, you can always go back on our YouTube channel and watch them all going back to August. Man, I wish that was around when I was in college and I could just watch a lecture whenever I felt like it. So uh, take a chance and explore the back catalog if you missed any. Finally, uh, this is the last week to order CMS University merch. If you are interested, the link is in uh, the video description below, and your order has to be in by Wednesday, February 24th. All the shirts say Class of 2021, kind of a fun way to commemorate these Monday evenings that we've been able to spend together. You can also get a mask or a window cling too, and some of the proceeds from this will benefit CMS. So if you're interested, please place your orders uh, today, tomorrow, tonight, tomorrow, or Wednesday. You can also support CMS University by uh, making a donation. So we have Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee, as well as our website. You can check those out. And uh, thank you in advance for supporting this. Uh, means a lot. All right, our moment of Zen tonight, our aural palate cleanser, our nighttime uh, musical nightcap is, of course, by J.S. Bach. How could we do a session on Luther without listening to a little Bach. We're gonna to listen to a movement of uh, his cantata, Jesu Meine, uh, I'm sorry, his motet, Jesu Meine Freude. So this is a motet that it, it, it maybe is a little deceiving title. It's 11 movements long, it's about 34 minutes long total, um, and it's a series of ideas. So it's a multi-movement work in a way. Um, and this, Jesu Meine Freude is Bach's um, probably most complex um, motet in terms of its structure. Um, it's really a beautiful piece that I, I hope to conduct one day soon. Um, this movement, Gute Nacht, Good Night, very kind of existential text, kind of using night as a metaphor uh, for death and the present life. Um, and the recording here is by the Netherlands Bach Society, and they do a really sublime job with this piece. So I hope you enjoy this little moment of Zen. Ah, that's the green screen.
Thank you again, everybody. I hope you're doing well and staying safe and, and healthy, enjoying this warmer uh, Florida-like weather we've been enjoying uh, today. And I hope to see you next week for another session of CMS University. Until then, I hope you take care. Have a good night.